uh, our work is uh, bioinformatics oriented. From since I started, we have uh, listened many talks, mostly on experimental uh, biology. But we do computational research. We just receive data from experimental labs and then try to analyze using computational algorithms and computer program. So this is the title of my today's talk. I will briefly discuss about what is systems biology and then focus on abstract database and a different topic, graph clustering algorithm, which we developed in our lab. And then I briefly discuss about two of our recent papers on metabolomics. Uh, each lab has a different definition of systems biology according to the area they fall. Because systems biology is a very comprehensive topic. And uh, I, so far I understand the theoretical target of systems biology is to understand life scientifically. Or in other words, we can say that understanding the cell as a system. For example, we understand very easily a computer or a car as a system, and we know that if we uh, lose some part of what may happen, but in case of the cell, still we do not know everything clearly. Which might be very difficult, but not impossible. Difficult because we need to handle a system consisting of billions of molecules, and in other words, we need to handle network consisting of billions of nodes, and even with high speed computers, it might be very difficult to simulate the things. But along with the achieving the, this theoretical target, we can try to achieve many other practical targets, for example, serving humanity by developing new generation medical tests, drugs, tools, and medical sensors, or even try to develop logic aids using the molecular biological principles. Uh, this is a cell, a bacterial cell, and cell is the basis of systems biology. We can really see that inside the cell, the environment is too much crowded. If we try to measure the engineering properties of the cells, like viscosity or osmotic pressure or electrical gradient, we can easily do that. But how many operations are taking place simultaneously or with under coordination? This is a mystery. Every group is trying to decipher the puzzle piece by piece. Maybe someday we need to integrate all these puzzles. The how a lot of signal transduction and transmission, energy propagation, and mass, trans mass transfer is taking place coordinated way. We uh, need to add many different types of information together, and we need very uh, huge uh, analysis of big system consisting of many elements. So maybe someday we will succeed to do that. If we notice carefully in systems biology, we can uh, find a hierarchy. Actually, in nowadays in systems biology, we are trying to analyze and understand the functions of molecules in different levels, starting from gene and then to, uh, a gene on the DNA. Those are nucleotide sequences, double helix type, and then the RNAs. They are nucleotide sequences, single helix type. And then, with the help of ribosome, about which we learned in detail yesterday, the proteins are synthesized, and the proteins, they are the building blocks of living organisms, and also they work as enzymes that catalyze the metabolic reactions. My today's talk focuses on this level. And together, all these molecules and their interactions determine the phenotype of any organism. So to understand a organism, we need to understand the interaction between all of them as a whole. So uh, next, I this is all about systems biology today. Next, I try to focus on abstract database. 
Uh, this book, uh, the fourth volume by Jim Gay, tried to explain the chronology of development of science in terms of four volumes. The first volume is Precision, Experimental and Experience-Based Learning and Inventions. The second volume is based on theory, like differential and infinite calculus, or law of thermodynamics, or law of electromagnetic waves and propagations, uh, which have been achieved by deep thinking. The third paradigm of simulation by computers, and the present paradigm is data physics. Nowadays, almost every branch of science is in, uh, involved with a huge amount of data. The huge amount of data is uh, bringing new challenges. For example, previously we are satisfied with p values, but because of huge data, we have to introduce the concept of q value or FDR in statistics. There are many other uh, cases we can mention that we need to handle very big data. And data analysis is uh, also trying to replace maybe many experiments on apparatus also by using algorithms. Anyway, to do research in data, we need databases. So, in our lab, we developed a simple database called Knapsack database where we try to accumulate information of, uh, uh, between species metabolic relations. And uh, we uh, still update it uh, occasionally. And we have around 50,000 unique metabolites and more than 102,000 species metabolic relations. And our database has been uh, cited by many papers. We also published many papers uh, based on our database in the last 10, 10 years. We started this work in 2004, and initially the pace of accumulation was not so high. So, and then we started automatic duplicate checkup, and our speech increased, and we have, have been uh, we have been able to finish it successfully within our target time. Uh, after that, uh, you see now we are accumulating little by little the uh, newly uh, obtained information through our database. So, uh, it is estimated that there are around 200,000 natural uh, products for metabolites in plants, and out of them, known are around 50,000. Almost all known metabolites we have limited in our database. And for example, uh, arachnopsis need around 5,000 metabolites, and human cells are with around 2,500 metabolites. And you can use, uh, this data is freely available, you can use uh, this for basic study in metabolomics or evolution of natural products or gene to metabolite relations, and also it costs like food science, health creation, urban medicine, and drug development by herbs. So being inspired by the popularity of our database, we extended it to knapsack family databases by including the information of healthy food, and food drug, especially Japanese traditional medicines and Indonesian uh, traditional medicines, Jamu. Also, currently, we are working on uh, biological activities of the metabolites. And also, we have some other mixed data like adaptive gene function or metabolic pathways and something like that. So, all that are freely available. You can log in, uh, you can go to this site and can download and can use for your research. And also online, you can search online using this simple interface. You need to enter a word here. If it is a metabolite name, just click metabolite value button and then click the list. Or if it is an organism name, you need to click here. So take for example, with sesame, if we search, we can find out all the species names that has been reported to contain sesame and also the structure and some other information of that metabolite you can find here. And if you try to search the database with the LEM SIPA organism name, and then you can find out which metabolites have been reported to be, exist in this organism. And, and many research uh, have been conducted using a NAPSA database, or they have cited a NAPSA database. This is a little bit old statistics for many different types of organisms. And we published a paper in 2013 based on our database, which is, uh, was decided as the best paper of plant cell physiology journal. And 
Also, we accumulated information about edible species, edible and medicinal species around the world, based on geographic locations. And we are now analyzing this data and we can explain many historical events like colonization and migration of uh, people from Europe to North America or westernization of Chinese and Japanese and Indian food styles. And by analyzing such type, type of data, we, it is now currently under publication. Also, we have uh, uh, extensive information about Jam Pamela. Jam uh, Indonesian herbal medicines. Uh, he, is, uh, he is a student in our lab he, from Indonesia. He did this work and he tried to relate uh, by you know, integration the efficacy of a formula in terms of the plants and almost 78% accuracy <coughs> he achieved. achieved. Anyway, uh, in our uh, our target is uh, to accumulate this data is to link plant omics with human omics. So we humans we consume many different types of uh, uh, plants uh, uh, as a medicine and food, and also we use them as cosmetics and other type of ointments. And those are plant omics molecules, metabolites, and proteins and others. They interact with human omics molecules. And in this way, we can create many different networks and can extract many different types of information. So for this purpose, we are accumulating data, our data of which are related to which level you can see from this slide. Therefore, to do research in systems biology, we need to be able to handle networks very efficiently. Actually, last 20 years, uh, we find that network theory has been applied extensively in systems biological research. So next, I try to discuss about this algorithm. This is a general purpose clustering algorithm, though we have developed it initially for finding protein complexes in PPI network. For example, this is a PPI network of only 3,000 proteins for E. coli, I think, that are generated in our, in our lab in our institute. But looking at only looking at this network, we cannot understand anything. We need this algorithm to find out uh, clusters. Usually, for networks, clustering is one of the important techniques to uh, mine uh, information. So, we need some algorithm to detect densely connected regions in a graph. So, in a graph, for example, this is a simple graph, and we can easily see that this is a cluster and this is a cluster. The property of the cluster is that the density of the cluster is more than the density of the whole graph. For example, this is density 1, this is density 0.9, so the density of the whole graph is very low. But considering density alone maybe is not enough. For example, the density of this graph is 0.5 and density of this whole graph is also 0.5. But we can find two different clusters here, where this is consisting of only one cluster. To tackle this problem, we introduce the concept of uh, periphery tracking we, we, with the help of a measure like this. If we measure the cluster uh, property of this node with respect to these uh, black mark nodes, we find it is 0.57, indicating that it is part of this cluster. But we try to determine the cluster property of this node with respect to this. It, it, this is very low, indicating that it is part of the periphery node the clusters. Anyway, using these techniques, we developed an algorithm and applied it to E. coli PPI network long ago, I think, and we found that similar function proteins are included in uh, individual clusters. Also, we applied it to a big network of East PPI. East PPI, and uh, also we, we found that uh, similar function proteins are included in each clusters. Here, we list out 29 clusters corresponding with hypergenetic p values and the gene names, and uh, we published this work in 2007 or 2006 in BMC Bioinformatics, and uh, the citation index you now is uh, uh, 387, uh, and also we have developed a tool uh, for, uh, based on this algorithm, so it has been easier for people to use this tool. Anyway, I mean, you can also download it, it is freely available in this site and you can use this tool for your research. Now, after we published our work, many people started to compare DP class with other algorithms. 
So in for most of the cases, uh, this class is this other pointer. So this class is good for most of the measures, but the precision is not so good. One of the reasons is we had some limitations in finding uh, uh, overlapping clusters. So we modified our algorithm and published again uh, the modified version in 2012. Uh, this is also If we apply the big class to this uh, network, we, we can find four clusters, but if we apply the big class four, we generate more clusters because we try to generate over the big clusters. Let's extract some more information from the network. Now, uh, we, uh, we compared our algorithm with OM coach to other different algorithms developed for finding protein complexes in PPI network, and we showed the DP class O background data. Now we are developing a GUI for DP class O. It is it still has not been published, but we did a, we are showing some progress. Uh, we can visualize the networks and clusters, and uh, each uh, hierarchical graph for the uh, clusters and uh, individual cluster with uh, surrounding uh, clusters. And so, a DP class and DP class one has been applied to many omics research, including metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, and so on. I just show you some examples now. Uh, in this work, we try to find out uh, growth specific metabolites in bacteria, and we apply DP class for finding classification of, for, for classification of ions in the metabolic metabolite derivative group for analyzing mass spectrometry data. And in this work, they try to compare their algorithm with DP class. And in this work, metabolomic correlation network clustering for arabidopsis. This one, they try to find out human protein complexes from human PPI network. Here, apply to transcriptomics for finding co expressed gene clusters in Oranja saliva. And here, finding disease pathways related to Parkinson's disease and also molecular markers, biomarkers. And here, also disease pathways related to osteoarthritis for another disease, and for also cancer pathways. And we applied it again in Jammu data for finding relation between plants and disease based on Jammu formula. And also, we tried to classify uh, our microorganisms based on. We are volatile organic compounds. And in the, this work, we try to apply uh, DP plus O for relating the structure of metabolites with their activities. Now, I try to focus a little bit more detail on this uh, topic compost very briefly. So, this is this, is this part. Now, uh, this paper we published in Molecular Informatics in 2014, and also luckily we received the best paper award for this journal uh, in 2014. And then this work is, has been conducted by four steps. In initial step, we constructed the network of metabolites based on structural similarity. So therefore, you can imagine we put an edge between two metabolites if they are structurally similar based, uh, based on complete algorithm. Now, after developing the network, in step two, we try to cluster it using TP plus O, and we found that many clusters are of a smaller size, but few clusters are of bigger size, and we found that this, this, this relation from the power law. In step three, we try to find out statistically significant clusters, that is the clusters which are enriched by similar activity metabolites. Because this cluster is consisting of similar structural metabolites. Now we try to find out which clusters are enriched by similar activity metabolites using the test. And also we applied FDR to, to select statistically significant clusters. And then the selected clusters and their activity, we try to make uh, multivariate data. 
And then in step four, we try to get again, let's say that we can cluster it and try to extract uh, groups of together mice which have similar activities. As an example, I can show you here that uh, this group is consisting of plant regulators, all of tetanoids, there will be 15,000 or so, okay. And this group is consisting of number system agents. Okay. And now we also developed recently a database of volatile organic compound. I think it started, some people uh, discussed. Uh, we can use VOC as biomarkers for lung cancer detection and these are those. Actually, not only biomarkers, but VOC is very important in ecology also. Many other agents communicate between themselves you know, using VOCs, so they are the natural signaling element. And also in agriculture, for example, pheromone trap and this and those have been developed, and other uh, applications of VOCs in agriculture, and of course, including in healthcare mostly. So we generated uh, 50 clusters by uh, considering the input parameters of 50 class density and the second level. And uh, we found that mostly independent nodes are non pathogenic bacteria, and some, uh, because one consists of both independent and uh, pathogenic and non pathogenic, but some other are pathogenic bacteria. So the pathogenic bacteria, they have very similar type of VOCs, but non pathogenic bacteria, they emit quite different types of VOCs, so they are like independent nodes. Therefore, graph clustering helps to find out some more information. And also, we try to classify the VOCs based on their uh, chemical structure. So to do that, we represented each uh, molecule uh, chemical formula of VOC by a fingerprint. We used 883 on fingerprint, which was consisting of some structures like this. And uh, when we have vectors, binary vectors, we can easily de determine the similarity between them using the Hanigoto uh, formula, uh, which is uh, something like this, the union and intersection of uh, features. For example, between these two chemicals, if you, you know, based on this substructure, if you try to calculate the similarity, it will be 0 0.6. And you can do this using KMIM R package easily uh, for many uh, chemical compounds by downloading the SDF files from PubChem database to determine the richness of similar activity metabolites in each cluster, we use the uh, hypergeometric p-value, which is based on this formula. And uh, in this study, we considered only 341 volatile organic compounds, for which we know the functions, typically. And then uh, uh, we, there are 11 types of biological activity we considered in this research. And Therefore, the data is compound and it's fingerprint, and based on the fingerprint, we make the kind of similarity matrix, and we can use this matrix for hierarchical clustering. Uh, we apply hierarchical clustering, and maybe <coughs> the division will also be. But we found 11 clusters here. 11 clusters, and uh, we also determine the p-values for which, uh, which clusters are reached by this similar type of DMC. And we selected statistically significant clusters. Uh, for example, cluster one is rich with uh, maybe antimicrobial, and cluster two is maybe also antimicrobial, or something like cluster three, biomarker related VOCs, cluster four is antifungal, and so on and so on. Attractant means a pollinator attractant, and some kind of. So we try, thus we think that if there are structural similarity, mathematically similar compounds based on polymeric similarity, can be considered that they may have uh, similar functions. This is cluster one consisting of 55 VOC or tetanoids. So now I, I have come to the conclusion of my talk. As a whole, system priority focuses on analyzing all these data of different types from different <laughs> levels of hierarchy. And we request all of you to use the abstract database and the class algorithm to do that pretty accurately for your research. Uh, secondary metabolites are useful nutrients, drugs, ingredients of cosmetics, fuels, biomarkers, and other materials. And so we need more focus on metabolics and systems, biology, on other frontier topics of science, and hopefully 
is making and will make many inventions and applications now and in the future. And now I, I, I want two, three more minutes to discuss about my institute. This is our Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. We have three graduate schools. It's only, uh, only, we have only PhD and master's students. We don't have any undergraduate. Information science, biological science, and material science. I work in information science. This is in Nara, very near to Osaka, Kyoto, and also Kobe. And this is the gate of the institute. And it's very beautiful in summer. Winter probably is also sometimes it snows. And uh, we inviting we are inviting uh, foreign students. Uh, but this is a very small institute, only 1,000 students, all our graduate students. And uh, we support foreign students with immigration and other type of activities, interesting activities. And now we have almost 211 students from 28 countries, from all over the world. And also we have many exchange programs and exchange agreement with many institutes all over the world. And so if you, uh, people are interested, you can contact with me or also any other person in our institute. And we support the students with mixed scholarships and also private funded scholarships and also nice international scholarships and also we provide RA and TA to graduate students. And our facility is on campus, a living facility for foreign students. We provide the dormitory for all the duration of the study. It's not so costly, even if you are interested to study on your own financial support, you can try it because this rent is very cheap compared to the rent in Japan. And we have digital library, healthcare center, guest house, and also university union for students, cafeteria, and, and what is it, the store, convenience store, and health club, and sports facilities. And also you can find jobs in many you know, companies, uh, usually nice students are finding jobs in these companies every year. And Professor Yamanaka, who received the Nobel Prize in 2012, uh, he actually got the Nobel Prize when he was a professor in Kyoto University, but the work for which he got the Nobel Prize, he started it in our institute. Uh, so we show this photo in the uh, present. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.